Hey guys, welcome to a session on Selenium interview questions by Simply Learn. In this video, we will look at most commonly asked questions in the interview and some guidelines on how to answer them. Nowadays, automation tool and especially the Selenium skills is a very key requirement for an QA engineer or even an automation engineer jobs. So if you're on the outlook of automation engineer or a QA engineer positions, I'm sure this question bank will definitely help you prepare for your interview. So this video consists of three parts, basically three different levels of set of questions. One is the beginner level, second is the intermediate level and then the advanced level questions. And each level has a set of 10 most probable questions which you might be asked in the interview. So let's begin with the beginner level questions. Question 1. What are Selenium suite components? So Selenium is a set of tools and libraries to facilitate automation on web applications. You already know this. It is not a single tool. So what are those components which are comprised in the Selenium? So Selenium comes with four major components. The first one is the ID. ID happens to be the most simplest tool in the whole suite of Selenium. It is nothing but an integrated development environment which has a record and playback functionality. This was earlier available as only Firefox plugin. However, you need to know that the new version of Selenium IDE is available as a Chrome extension as well as a Firefox plugin. So that means you can either use any of the browsers that is Firefox or the Chrome for recording your test scripts. Also, you should also know that the new ID comes with many new features and uh, now this new ID has become more powerful than what was available earlier. So some of these new features are like reusability of your test cases. It comes with a better debugger now and most importantly, it supports parallel test execution. And how does it do that? It has a utility called Selenium Side Runner. That's about Selenium ID. The next component is the Selenium Remote Control. So Selenium Remote Control or popularly called as Selenium RC is used to write web application tests in different programming languages. It supports multiple programming languages like Java, C Sharp, Perl, Python, Ruby and PHP. It is nothing but it's a server which interacts with your browser using a simple HTTP GET and POST request for communication. Selenium RC is also called as Selenium 1.0 version or Selenium Core. Third component, Selenium WebDriver. It is a programming interface to run your test cases. And WebDriver was introduced by Simon Stewart in 2006. And this was introduced to overcome some of the limitations of Selenium RC. So RC's architecture was very complex because it required an additional server in its setup. And why was that additional server? For communicating with the browser. And what WebDriver did was it removed this dependency completely. WebDriver interacts directly with the browser and also makes your test cases run much faster than your RC. The last component, the Selenium Grid, a very important tool. This is used to run multiple test scripts on multiple machines at the same time. Now with the Selenium WebDriver, you can only do sequential execution. But in real-time environment, you always have the need to run test cases in a distributed environment. So this grid allows parallel execution of tests on different browsers as well as different operating systems. So the, the design is in such a way that commands are distributed on multiple machines where you want to run the test and they are executed simultaneously. This uses a simple hub and node concept where hub controls the all execution of your test cases on the nodes. And this is how we achieve parallel execution. And what is the major advantage of having this grid? It is to reduce your overall test execution time. Question 2. What are the limitations of Selenium? Now, like any other tool, Selenium also has certain limitations. So when you are answering this question, you will also be expected to talk about what is the workaround available for all these limitations. So let's look at them one by one. No reliable tech support. Of course, Selenium is an open source. So if you look at it, you do not have much technical support available. However, there are loads of documentation available. There are forums available which you can refer to. SeleniumHQ.org is the website, is your Bible if you're working with the Selenium. And then there are, there are a lot of Selenium Google groups and the forums which are available for any kind of support. So Selenium has been there for quite some time. So it's, it's one of the most mature tool available today. So even though we do not have a technical support available, there is enough documentation available on the internet. The second limitation, Selenium can test only web application. 
Selenium is an open source tool that is designed to automate web-based applications on different browsers. But it cannot handle Windows GUI or non-HTML pop-ups in the application. Now, what is the workaround available for that? Selenium provides a support for integrating other tools like AutoIt. So AutoIt is a tool for handling your Windows-based activity. Selenium also cannot automate mobile applications. But then what is available with that? It can integrate a tool called APM tool, which is a mobile automation tool. The third limitation, limited support for image testing. Selenium is a de facto tool for functional web, app web application tests. So standard API allows interacting only with the browser and it's hard to test the images based applications using Selenium. What is the other tool available? Securely is a very good tool to use for image testing. And this again, you can integrate Securely with Selenium. That's how you can achieve your image testing through Selenium, but using the Securely tool. No built-in reporting facility. So Selenium does not have any reporting capability as such. Of course, it does provide a very limited reporting capability where some basic reports are created. But definitely, when you are working in a framework, you need a better support for uh, good reporting tools. So that way, Selenium supports some of the tools like Test TestNG, ReportNG and Extent Reports, using which you can integrate these tools with Selenium and generate beautiful reports. Limited test management. Selenium does not provide any test tool integration with test management tools. May require knowledge of programming languages. So since Selenium supports multiple programming languages, the developer of the test automation will require to have some basic knowledge of any of the supported programming language. Why? One, in order to write your effective automation scripts. And of course, because Selenium tool, you want to use it at its full potential. Question three, what are the testing types supported by Selenium? So Selenium supports regression testing and functional testing. These can be called as a very high level categories. So what is regression testing? Regression testing is a full or partial selection of already executed test cases, which are re-executed to ensure your existing functionality does not break. So let's look at what are these attributes of regression testing and why we say that Selenium helps us in doing regression testing. So regression tests are run every time a new fix has been received or a new feature has been deployed. So that is called as retesting. You can always select a full suite or select a test to test a fix or a complete product. So your selection can be based on recently added features, a test area where most defects are there or integration areas or even end-to-end -end kind of tests. You can also prioritize your test cases based on critical functionalities and business impact of these test cases according to the priority set. So all this can be done using Selenium. Now, what is the second category of the testing which it supports? Functional testing. So functional testing includes what? Your smoke test, sanity test, say install test, database test, basically any kind of functionality which you're going to test. And if you look at the kind of steps which are involved in it, it involves identification of your test inputs, expected outputs or the results, the test case logic itself and the assertions. So a typical flow will be uh, you identify your test inputs first, then you derive your test outcomes or the expected outputs. You design and execute your test cases and then assert on the expected versus actual outcomes. Question 4. What are Selenium 2.0 and 3.0 versions? So Selenium was introduced by a gentleman called Jason Huggins way back in 2004 and that was Selenium version. Since then, this tool has gone through multiple changes to make it better and better. So if Selenium 2.0 version had a major change, it took a leap forward in terms of browser automation. The Selenium RC, the remote control, had a disadvantage of having the need of an additional server to talk to the web browsers. And because of this, the text execution was much slower and the comp uh, architecture itself became very complex. So if you look at this Selenium 2, it had two components, a successor to RC and the RC itself, which is called as your core. So this successor was nothing but your web driver API. So web driver APIs made it easier to write your automation scripts for any browser by simply using a suitable driver for any browser which you want to run the tests on. Apart from these two components, the Selenium 2.0 version also had the ID and the grid components. So in summary, if you look at it, Selenium 2.0 version has an ID. It has Selenium RC, which was on its way of deprecation 
WebDriver API, which was just introduced in there, a very, very earlier version of WebDriver API and the grid. So what did Selenium 3.0 consist? So Selenium 3.0 RC was completely eliminated now because in 2.0 it was already on its path of deprecation and WebDriver replaced RC completely. So you, if you look at the components of 3.0, we have IDE, we have a WebDriver and Grid as the major components. So now with this introduction of WebDriver, a full-fledged WebDriver, Selenium became the most powerful tool for web application automation. Question 5, a very important question. What is same origin policy and how is it handled? Now, same origin policy is a security IT feature. So, it is a very important concept in web application security model. And what is this? According to this policy, a web browser allows scripts from one web page to access the contents of another web page provided both these pages are on the same origin. Now, what does origin mean? Origin is nothing but a combination of your URL schema, the host number and the port number. It's, it's basically your domain. Now, if a, such question is asked, how are you going to explain it? So, let's say you have a JavaScript program which runs in a certain domain, say google.com. Okay. So, this program can access all the programs which are from the same origin. Now, origin here is what google.com. So, for example, you can access other pages like your Google Drive, your Google email or your Google Calendar. However, now if you use the same JavaScript, right? So, if you use the same script from the google.com to access another page or an element in a different domain, say yahoo.com, then the security model of the web application itself prohibits you to do so. So, what happens because of that is you are limited with access only to those elements and pages which are in the same domain. But now look at a case that you want to run your test on multiple servers and you might also want to access multiple domain. So due to the same origin policy, you will not be able to do so. And this became a major limitation with a very early Selenium tool. So how was this handled? So this got handled by Paul Hammond who created the Selenium remote control. So he created the Selenium remote control server to trick the browser in believing that the Selenium core and the web application under test actually came from the same domain. And this is how the same origin policy was handled. And this Selenium RC, which is Selenium Remote Control, became the version 1 of Selenium. Question 6. What is Selenies and how is it classified? Selenium commands for Selenium ID are often called as Selenies. They are a set of commands that run your test and sequence of this command is called as a test script. Now these commands are categorized into three major categories. One is the action command. Now action commands are the commands that generally manipulate the state of your application. For example, they can do things like click on this link or select a particular option, open a URL, type certain text into an input box, click or double click on any web element and so on. So these are called as action commands. The second set of commands is the accessors. Now accessors examine the state of the application and store the results in a variable. So it basically allows the user to store certain values to a user defined variable. For example, if I want to store the page title of a web page, I can do that by defining a user defined variable. And then these stored values can be later used to create your assertions or verifications in your test. Now few examples of such commands are, you can just use a store, S-T-O-R-E, or a store text, store title, or a store value. So these are some of the accessor commands. The third category is the assertions. Assertions are like your accessors, but they verify the state of your application and conforms to what is expected. So basically it is a comparison of your actual versus expected results. There are two types of assertions available. One is the soft assertions and the hard assertions. An example of a soft assertion can be verify title, wherein you verify the title, check whether the expected and the actual outcomes are the same and continue with your test case. Now, whereas an hard assertion is you do an assert title using the command assert title and if at all the assertion fails, the test case stops from executing. Question 7. Mention the types of web locator. What is web locator? A locator is a command that tells the Selenium which UI element you want to operate on. Selenium uses locators to find and match the elements of your web page which it needs to interact with. And there are around 8 locating techniques in Selenium. The first one is by ID. 
Now this is the most common way of locating elements. Why? Since the IDs are supposed to be unique for each element. The IDs can also be dynamic in nature. So you can identify them by inspecting the attributes of the web element. So let's look at an example. So if we go to a Facebook, right? So if you go to the Facebook and say if I want to identify this element email. So if you look at this highlighted text here, it has a unique ID which is email. So if I'm going to operate on this particular element email, I can directly use the ID locating technique. Link text and the partial link text. So this type of locator applies only to the hyperlink text. So we access the link by using this locator which needs the hyperlink text to be provided. So for link text, you can give a complete text in the link text or let's let's look at an example of that so let's if we go to say one of the e-commerce site which is say amazon.in and say you want to click on this today's deal link so if you look here in amazon.in there are a lot of hyperlinks available here and if an example if you have to take an example say we want to click on the today's deal now if you inspect this element you will see that it has an anchor tag a it has an associated href link here and also it has a text which says today's deal right which is what is displayed on your web page. Now similarly, there is also a link available here called customer service. So if you inspect that customer service, it also has something similar what the today's deal had. It has an anchor tab, it has an href link and it has a long text which says customer service which is what is displayed. Now if you have to use your web locator which is a link text, you need to provide the complete text which is displayed on your web page. And there is another way of using the link text by saying partial link text where you can just give a partial text which can be matched against the complete text of your link. And this is how you can use your partial link text or the link text. The next ID is by name. So locating elements by name is very similar to locating by ID. Just that your attribute instead of using an ID, you're going to use name in this case. Now if you look at the same example of say Facebook, we identified this email element using its ID. You can also locate the same element by using the name attribute, which is also unique in this case, which has a value called email. Tag name, that's the next identifier. So locate element using tag name of the element. Now say if you want to identify all the elements on your web page, which are of type button. So that you can do by using the tag name as button there. For example, again, on your Facebook page, I know that there is a single button here which is of type button and which has a tag as button. And this is the only button which is available on this page. So if I want to access this particular element, I can simply use a locator technique called tag, which is button in this case. Next locator, class name. So locate an element using its class name attribute. So you can use this identifier only if you find that a class name is unique for a web element which you want to work with. Class names are sometimes unique. A web element can also have multiple class name or even you will find some elements which has no class name. So depending on what is available in the attributes, you can uh, use this class name for identification. So example, the shown in, on your screen here where it says find element by class name input text. Basically, this is going to list out all elements on your web page which has a class name called input text. The next identifier is by XPath. Now, XPath is a language used when locating XML nodes. What is XML? Extendable Markup Language. It can access almost any element, even those without any class names or names or even ID attributes. So whenever you do not find a unique attribute for ID name or class name, you can construct an XPath to create a unique identifier for that particular element. Now, for example, on this Facebook page, if you observe here, there is a label here called create an account. So if you inspect this particular label, it has no attributes other than a tag called spam. So if you want to identify this particular element and say display it, this is one of the ways to do it is through XPath. CSS selector. So CSS selector are string patterns used to identify an element based on the combination of either the HTML tag, ID, class or any other attributes. Locating by CSS selector is little more complicated than any of the previous method. However, the advantage is CSS selectors work much faster than the XPath. The performance of your test scripts is much better when you use CSS selector than any other locating technique. Now again, as an example, if you see the Facebook again, you can identify the same email here, right? I, I used an ID here or a name attribute here to identify it. 
So assume that if you did not have any of those things or if you want to use a CSS selector here, you can still do that by using this syntax. This is how you use the CSS selector to identify an element. Question 8. What are the types of weights supported by WebDriver? Now, before even you answer this question, you should know why do we need weights. In Selenium, weights play a very important role in executing test cases. Most of the web applications are developed using, using Ajax and JavaScripts. So when a page is loaded by the browser, the elements which you want to interact may load at a different time intervals. Not only this makes it difficult to identify the elements, but also if the element is not located, it will start throwing element not visible exception. And how do we resolve this? By using the weights. So there are three different kind of weights available in Selenium. First one is the implicit weight. The implicit weight tells the browser or your web driver to wait for a certain amount of time before it can throw a no such element exception. Now the default setting is zero for this. Once we set a time, what web, web driver does it, it will wait for that time. Say if you have mentioned 10 seconds, it will wait for 10 seconds until it finds the element. And even in the 10 seconds, it is unable to find that element. Only after that, it throws an exception. Now what is the syntax of this? Implicit weight is, uh, this is the syntax of this, where you use driver.manage timeouts, implicit weight, and there is a timeout value, say 10 seconds, and the unit, whether it's in minutes, seconds, or milliseconds is what you can mention. Implicit weight is applied globally to all the elements, which means it is available for all the web elements throughout the driver instance. Implicit weight is defined only once, and it will remain same throughout the driver object instance. Now let's see what explicit weight is. So explicit weight is used to tell the web driver to wait for certain conditions before throwing an element not visible exception. It is defined to wait for certain expected conditions only. Now these expected conditions can check whether the element is displayed on the web page or not or can be clicked or not. So any kind of conditions you can mention there. So these are called as conditional weights and they are applied on a web element on a single web element unlike the implicit weight which was kind of applied globally to all elements. It is definitely recommended to use this explicit weight when your elements are taking longer time to load and also for verifying the property of the elements like say visibility of the element located, element to be click clickable or element to be selected. Then we have fluent weight. Now fluent weight is used to tell the web driver to wait for a condition that is very similar to the explicit weight as well as a frequency with which we want to keep checking the condition before throwing the not visible exception. So fluent weight is used to define the maximum amount of time you want the web driver to wait for a condition. Then if you look in the syntax, then there is polling every second. So polling every and you give a timeout. This could be like five seconds. So start polling to see whether the web element is available or not. Say once in three seconds, once in four seconds, depending on your use case. And then dot ignoring. So you can also try to ignore specific type of exceptions while waiting. Now, for example, such as no such element exception, which is sometimes thrown when searching for an element on the page. So you can mention even that here. So fluent weight takes two parameters. One is the timeout value and the polling frequency. So when we have web elements, which sometimes are visible after a few seconds, or sometimes it takes more time than usual, like uh, we have Ajax applications as an example, we can set a default polling period based on our requirement. And then, as I said, you can also ignore some of the exceptions while polling this element. Question nine, mention the types of navigation commands available in Selenium. So WebDriver provides a basic uh, browser navigation commands that allows the browser to move forward, backward, refresh, and uh, using the browser history. And this is done using some of the driver.navigate methods, right? So these are some of the commonly used navigation methods. First one is navigate to. So this method loads a new web page in the existing browser window and it accepts string as a parameter and returns nothing. So it's a void. So the URL you mentioned here needs to be a fully formed URL. Driver.navigate.refresh. So this method refreshes or reloads the current web page in the existing browser window. It neither accepts anything, so there is no value passed or it returns nothing. Forward. So this method enables the web browser to click on the forward button in the existing browser window. Again, this has, uh, this has no arguments to be passed or it returns nothing. Driver.navigate.back. So this method enables the web browser to click on the back button in the existing browser window. Again, this returns nothing nor it needs any argument. Question 10. 
what is the major difference between driver dot close and driver dot quit so this is again a very important question and pretty confusing also sometimes so selenium web driver provides two methods for closing the browser window one is browser dot close and the other one is the browser dot quit so you might think to use them interchangeably and that's that's what everybody thinks that both anyway does the same function so it can be used however it is not so both are two different methods now driver dot close command is used to close the current browser window which is having the focus and in case if there is a only single browser window open then calling this driver dot close actually quits the complete browser session now it is used when you're working with say multiple browser tabs or windows and you want to just close one of them which is in focus in the test right whereas the driver dot quit is used to quit the complete browser session along with all its associated windows tabs popups and everything so when do you use browser dot quit it is best to use use browser dot quit or sorry driver dot quit when you no longer want to interact with the driver object along with all its associated windows tabs and popups generally it is one of the last statements of your automation scripts so in case you are like working with selenium or with test ng or j unit we usually call this driver dot quit in the after suite that is at after suite method of our test suite thus by by doing that we close the complete browser session at the end of the test suite execution now let's look at some intermediate level questions question 11 how to type in an input box using selenium so selenium provides a method or a command you can say to insert value into any of the input box and this command is called as a send keys command so send keys is a method available in a web element now this is how you use the send keys so here is an example so first you need to find the element using any of the eight locating techniques and once you find the element in this case which is an email field uh, you need to call a method called send keys send keys takes an argument which is of type string so you can pass the value which you want to pass to the web element so in this case you'll be passing a gmail id or any id which will be your email id here and then similarly you do it for your password field so first you find the element password and then you send the password using send keys this is a very simple method to use question 12 how to click on a hyperlink in selenium So whenever you are testing a e-commerce application you are going to find lot of hyperlinks on your web pages which you will obviously need to test now selenium provides two locating techniques using which you can identify this hyperlinks and using these is what you need to operate on the hyperlinks on your web pages so one is using link text and other one is using partial link text so using link text you give a complete text in the link text that is if you look at any your e-commerce eh? let's say amazon.in let's let's go to that website and see what it means so in the amazon.in if you look at uh, some of these hyperlink text called today's deals or amazon pay or sell or customer service if you inspect this element you will see that this is associated with a link text which is called as today's deal along with its href and of course an anchor tag so one way of identifying this link is to use this complete text which is today's deal also there is another way by using partial link text for say example you have a link text which is pretty long and you do not want to use this complete text instead you can use the locating technique called partial link text and give a partial text from that in this example instead of giving the complete customer service here you can just say use a customer or you can just use service as your text only thing what will be required here is this has to be unique on this page there shouldn't be two elements which would have this text which you are going to use so let's quickly see this in action how do we use this link text and partial link text now we will be using the same example of amazon.in so my use case is first i will click on this today's deal and after a sleep of 2 or 3 seconds i will also click on customer service and i am going to achieve this one by using link text so if you see in this program so i have this method written which is going to click on today's deal and this is using a locating technique link text and then i also have another method here by using partial link text i am going to be clicking on the customer service link right so let's see how this works so i'll just go ahead and execute this so this launches the amazon.in and the first thing what we are doing is it is going to click on today still all right that is done and then it will click on the customer service link right so this is how you can achieve clicking on the hyperlinks in your web applications question 13 how to scroll down a page using javascript this is a very important question 
and usually this gets asked quite often in the interview. You should know that you can run Java scripts through Selenium and Selenium provides a way to do this. Selenium provides an interface called JavaScript Executor, JavaScript Executor and this helps in executing any kind of JavaScripts through the Selenium web driver. So this JavaScript Executor, it has basically two methods. One is execute script and the other one is execute async script to run the JavaScript on the selected window or on your current bridge. But why do you need this? Right? So if, if you're answering this question, you should also have a background that why at all this is required because sometimes you need to perform certain functions which cannot be done using the locators what has been provided like say scrolling down the web page itself. Also, sometimes you will see that you are unable to even identify some web elements using all the locating techniques which is made available by Selenium. So in such situations, what you can do is you can directly write a JavaScript and execute it using this JavaScript executor. And if you look at it, the syntax is something like this. So it says JavaScript executor JS is equal to JavaScript executor and driver. Now, if you look at this, JavaScript executor is an interface. That means you cannot create an object of it and hence you typecast it to your driver object. Now, how do you do this? Now, first thing what you do is you launch your web application on whatever web application is under test and then on that current window, you call this particular execute script method using the JavaScript executor. And then you can perform any functions here. In this example, we are seeing a function which is crawling down vertically. So this function takes an attributes or arguments like x coordinate and the y coordinate. Now in this example, our x coordinate is 0 and y coordinate is 1000. That means when this command gets executed, the page is going to get scrolled down vertically by 1000 pixels. So why don't we just see this in action? So let's go to another program here called the scrolling tester java so basically what i'm doing here is i'm going to be logging into amazon.in and then i will show you how to scroll down by 600 pixels so it's a very very simple code to write you launch your application then you create your object of javascript executor right actually you typecast it to the driver and then you just use an execute script command or a method this you see is your actual script which gets executed which says windows dot scroll by 0 comma 600 which is x coordinate and y coordinate let's go ahead and execute this so an amazon dot in is launched and you should see the screen scroll it down yes there we go so it just scrolled down by few pixels and that is 600 pixels what we mentioned see i could scroll back again and that is how you can achieve scrolling functions and when do you usually use this say if you have a very long web page and you want to go and identify or do some operations on the web element which is probably available to you towards the end of the page and that is when you can use some of the scrolling functions question 14 how to assert the title of a web page selenium web driver provides web driver methods and one such method is called get title so what get title does is it fetches the title of the current page how to use this command get titles returns a string which is nothing but your title of your page that means you need a string variable in which you can store this value so what you do is you define a string variable like it is defined in this example to store your title and then you execute this command driver.getTitle which is going to fetch the title and that value gets stored in your actual title. Once you get the title, you can do any operations with that. In this case, what we are doing is we are trying to verify the title. There are two ways which you can verify them. One is using an if else statement where you compare your actual title with the expected title or alternatively, you can also use assert statements here. Right? So Selenium provides us assert statement. So using assert, you can validate whether your title of the web page is as expected. Question 15. How to mouse hover over an element? In automation, many times it is required to perform some action on the element which gets visible only on the mouse hovering on those elements. Now in Selenium, action is a class which we can use to achieve this functionality. So action class is defined in a package called as selenium.interactions. This has a set of APIs to emulate complex user gestures. It helps in building the patterns of action and then perform that action on a web element. Now this action class provides a rich set of APIs like so for mouse events and even the keyboard events. So say for to perform any kind of mouse event, it provides a method called move to element. Now in this example, what you do is you initiate an object of mouse class and then use this move to element method 
and what it does is the element is scrolled into the view first even before the move operations happen so you could have multiple actions like here in this example we are just using move to element but also you can if you want to do a drag and drop operation you can still have that so in such case where you have multiple actions like a drag and drop then you use a method called build along with this so you say actions dot move to element dot build and then dot perform so dot build method is called before the perform method and what it does is it generates that composite actions which has all those multiple actions which you want to perform on a web element then after the building action is done you call a perform method which actually performs that action on your web element and this is how the move to element method of the action class is used why don't we just see that in action let's say let's go to our eclipse here and i have a mouse hover test written here so let's say we go to amazon.website so in the amazon uh, if you go to the shop by category, you see that? So the moment I mouse hover it, it is going to give me this drop down list. So for me to select any element from this, my first action on this web page should be to go and just hover my mouse over this web element called shop by category. And that's exactly I'm going to achieve through my automation. Now here in my methods here, what I've written, I have said, okay, first launch your website, which is amazon.in. And then I'm finding that element which is shop by category using an XPath. So you could use any available locating technique to find the element first. And then I instantiate an object of actions. And then simply I'm doing is I'm using the method move to element. And then I'm just going to say perform. That means my mouse would actually get moved or hovered onto that particular element. Okay, so let's see this in action. So I'll just execute this test case. Okay, so Amazon.in is launched and now we should see, yeah, the mouse actually moved to shop by category and because of that, we got this drop down list. So, and this is how you can achieve your mouse hover functionality. Question 16, how to retrieve the CSS properties of an element? Now, CSS is nothing but cascading style sheets. It's a style sheet language used for describing the presentation of a document written in your markup language. It basically describes your HTML elements as how they need to be displayed on the screen. It's basically the look and feel, like your font size, the width, height, color, and so on. So it provides a special and easy way to specify various properties of the element. Now, why do we need this? We need to use a special method called getCSSValue to retrieve such CHS properties of web element. Why? Because we already have a method called getAttribute which can retrieve the value of the attributes, right? However, the get attribute method can only retrieve those properties where the attribute and its value are mentioned in your DOM. And hence, all this font size color cannot be retrieved through the get attribute method. And that is why we use the get CSS value. So basically, it works like your get method and you need to provide the attribute which you want to fetch using the get CSS value. So in this example, what we are trying to do is we have a, a web element called the email ID and of that we are trying to fetch the font size. So let's again check this in action. So if I go to my web page here, let's close this. So if I go to my Facebook, and if I inspect this particular element, which is the email ID. And on the right, if you see, there are multiple other attributes of that element you see, right? So you see the background color, you see the color here, then you see something called as font size. And say, for example, we want to retrieve the font size of this particular web element. And you will also see on the left, where you're seeing the DOM here, you do not see that font size anywhere as an attribute and its value here. And that is why I cannot use the get attribute method to retrieve it. Now, instead of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the get CSS value and use this font size for that. So let's go to my Eclipse. I have a method written here where I log into the Facebook and then I'm going to first find that element, which is by ID, and I'm going to retrieve the CSS value. And I'm just simply printing it on the console. So if I execute this, so it's going to launch the Facebook. And since I'm not going to do anything on the Facebook web page as such, let's go to my console here because this is where I'm expecting the output. So here it has given me an output in the console saying 12 px, which is nothing but your actual font says what you see here in your HTML page, right? And this is how you can extract your CSS properties of any web element on your web page. Question 17. What is page object model, popularly known as POM? Page object model is a design pattern that helps create object repositories for web elements. 
So writing selenium test cases without say using any patterns may lead to code duplicacy and also the code becomes unmaintainable after some time. And say if you have web element locators which changes over time, then you will have to go through the entire code base to make all the required changes. So under this model, for each web page in the application, there should be a corresponding page class. And this page class will have all the web elements of the web page and also it contains the page methods which perform operations on the web elements. And the verification steps required in your test cases are the separate test cases itself. They are not combined in the same class. Now the tests that use the methods of this page object class whenever they need to interact with the UI of that page. The benefit here is if the page UI changes then the tests need not be changed. Only the code within this page object class needs to be changed. That is you go and just change the web elements or the locators of the web elements only in one place which is your page class and not in any of your test classes or not test classes. So how does this form help? So it makes the code more readable, maintainable and reusable. So there are two ways you can implement a POM or a page object model. One is done using the page factory which is offered by Selenium and then you can also achieve a page object model without using the page factory and right? using directly the objects and the classes. Question 18. Can CAPTCHA be automated? This is again a very favorite question of the interviewer. CAPTCHA is a security feature that prevents bots and automated programs from accessing sensitive information. Yes, and CAPTCHA cannot be automated. You will see that there are many applications today who have CAPTCHA. Why? Because it's a security feature. It is a concept to differentiate between human and computers. The idea of CAPTCHA itself is to prevent any automated process or a robotic process to do any kind of actions. And say if you're going to automate it, then the entire idea of having the CAPTCHA is lost. So you should never attempt to automate it. But then what do you, how can you handle this then? One, either you can ask your developers to disable it in the test environment so that you can test the whole application without having to hit on this CAPTCHA. Other way of doing this is you can use static data for your CAPTCHA so that you can hard code that value in your test for the time being. And then since your application has CAPTCHA as one of its functionality, if you really need to test that, you can just test that separately as a manual testing itself, but not automated. Question 19. How does Selenium handle Windows based pop-up? Selenium is an automation tool for automating web applications. It cannot handle Windows based application. However, we can use tools like AutoIt and Robot Class along with Selenium to handle such pop ups. So, what are these tools? Robot Class is a Java class which, along with Selenium, can simulate your keyboard and mouse events. It also helps in upload and download of files and also to manage the pop ups. So, wherever you have a requirement of doing a file upload operation, in which if your native dialog box opens up, then one of the way to handle it is using robot class. Other tool which is available for us is the auto it tool. It is a freeware and what it does is it uses a combination of your mouse movement, keystrokes and window control manipulation to automate any such task which is not possible by Selenium web driver. And again, this auto it tool can be integrated with Selenium and thus you can achieve the automation of native window based pop-ups. Question 20. How to take screenshots in WebDriver? Take screenshot interface can be used to take screenshots in WebDriver. So Selenium provides us this interface for managing our screenshot operations. Now screenshots are desirable for bug analysis. So Selenium can automatically take these screenshots during your execution. You know that it is very important to take screenshots when we execute the test scripts. Say if we have a huge number of test scripts running and if some of the test case fail, we need to check why these test case failed. So using the screenshot functionality, it helps us debug and identify the problem by looking at those screenshots. So WebDriver has this built-in functionality to take the screenshot across the page and it's pretty easy to use. Take screenshot interface is used to capture the screenshot during the execution. Now this interface has a method called get, get screenshot as which captures a screenshot and it also stores in a location specified by us. So let's take an example of our Facebook page and say we fail a particular test case on the Facebook application and then let's see how we take a screenshot at that particular moment when the test case fails. So let's go to the Facebook page first 
and let's understand the use case. So in this Facebook page, say if I am signing up on this page, I need to enter all this field. Now as a part of demo, what I will do is I'll just enter the first name and the surname and I will click on the sign up button. With this test case, it should basically not sign me up, rather it should give me some error saying that you need to enter all the fields. And at that minute, we are going to take a screenshot. Okay, so that's our use case. So let's see how do we achieve that. So if I go to my Eclipse and let's say we go to my screenshot test.java, I have a method written here. So and these are the operations which I just described, which I'm doing it here. So I'm going to just send keys, my first name to the first name field second name into the surname field and then I'm just going to click on the sign up button. Now there are few things required for us to do before we use the take screenshot interface along with its method which is the get screenshot as. So I said that this method stores the screenshot taken in a file. So that means I need to provide it a file name and also a location where it needs to be placed. So in our demo here in this test class what I've done is I've created a folder called screenshot in the same project directory and then I am giving it a file name called fblogin.png. So that means after the screenshot is taken, it is saved in a file called fblogin.png and then it is stored in the location screenshot folder. And these are the simple file operations of Java which I use to achieve this. So let's execute this and see how this happens. So right now I have the screenshot folder and it's an empty folder. So after the execution, I'm expecting that this particular file would get created. So let's see that in action. So I'll go ahead and execute this Java program. Okay, so we have launched the facebook.com and then I entered the my first name, second name and it has also clicked on sign up after which it has given all this red marks here. And now this is what I'm expecting in the screenshot. So let's go back to our Eclipse. I will refresh this folder. So I'll say right click and refresh. Okay, I have this file created. So let's open this file and see, right? So do you see this? This whole image has been captured. So now as a tester, if at all this test case fails for me, I can always open this PNG file and see what actually happened and I can debug my test case. So this is how you use screenshot functionality in Selenium. Level questions. Question 21. Can you type in a text box without using send keys? So you need an alternative way to use instead of using the send keys function. And one such alternative is using JavaScript executor. So Selenium provides an interface called JavaScript executor and this helps in executing any JavaScripts through your Selenium web driver. So you can do any kind of function using this JavaScript. And one of the functions which we can do is the send keys kind of a function. Now how to replicate a send keys function using JavaScript. So let's see an example here. Now since this JavaScript executor is an interface, you cannot create an object of this interface. So what you do, you type cast it to your driver object the way it is done here in this example. And then you use document dot get element id to get the actual element on which you're going to perform the operations of sending the keys. Now what is this document? So it is an object, right? So this document, it's an object that represents your HTML document which is displayed in that window. And this document object has various properties that refer to other objects which allows you the access to modify any of your document content. So the argument which you're passing to the Java execute script is nothing but your JavaScript. Now this JavaScript uses the document object to identify your element and then send the value which you need to send to that element. So let's see this in action as how it works. So let me show you a small program here, all right? So I have a method here wherein I'm trying to identify the email field of your Facebook page. So if this is your Facebook application, this is my email field. And instead of using send keys here, I'm going to pass an email value to this. And how am I doing that? Using a JavaScript executor, right? So if I execute this particular Java program, it is exactly going to do the same function what I would do otherwise using the send keys. So let's execute this and see if I can see my user's ID email in the Facebook application. So the Facebook application is launched and there we go. So we this is the value which I have sent using my JavaScript, okay? So this is how you can use a JavaScript executor to replicate a send keys method. Question 22, how to select a value from your dropdown list in the Selenium web driver? So select class is a Selenium web driver. It is used for selecting and deselecting options in your dropdown list. 
the objects of select type can be initialized by passing the drop down web element as a parameter to its constructor like in this example i'm saying select drop down equal to new select of test drop so test drop is nothing but the web element which i have identified using any locating techniques after you create the select object then you have three different methods available for actually selecting your methods and what are these methods one is select by index now the index starts with zero in the list so you can select any element from your list using the index id and then the second one is select by values so this is used to select an option based on its value attribute select by visible text so this is an option wherein you can select a particular list item or an option based on the text displayed in the option so that means whatever text you can see on your drop down list is what you will use it to identify that particular element so let's see the demo for this so i have again a same facebook application which i've considered here for demo so if you go to our Facebook application first, you know that there is a drop down menu here. Now this drop down is for selecting your birth date. This has a day values which you can select, the month values, right, and the year. Now what I have done in my code is, first thing is I've identified all these drop down boxes using one of, I'm using mostly the ID locating technique here. So you can use any of your choice. So once I identify the element, I created the select object class for each of this and I pass that web element to the constructor of the select class. So now my select element or the object is ready to use. So my next step what I need to do is I need to go and select the actual dates. Now in this use case what I want is I want to select a date which is 10th June 2005. That means on my select drop down of the day I should be able to select the day 10. Now this I am achieving by using select by value. And then I'm selecting the bun month based on the index, which is the index in this case is six, which will select the June for me. And then the third one, I'm trying to select it by visible text, wherein I'm selecting the year 2000 Y. So when I execute this program, let's see how the date selection happens. Okay, there we go. So it selected the 10, the day 10, the June month and the 2005. So this is how you use select objects in Selenium. Question 23, what does the switch to command do? So switch to command is used to switch between windows, frames or even the alert pop-ups within your application, right? So there are multiple things which you can do with switch to. Now, sometimes in your web application, say when you click on a button, it opens up a completely new browser window or you'll also see it opens up another tab in your browser. Say for example, let's look at one of this application which I have. Let me go to my browser and say I launch hdfcbank.com all right so this is my application say which you want to test now when you launch this first thing is i see this advertisement pop-up which comes up which is right now an unwanted pop-up so right now i'll just close this and now if i want to enter this hdfc bank application first i need to do a login so if i click on this login button see there is a new window which opens up and I need to go and operate into this window. So for any further operations, I want to do it on this web page. I need to switch to this window and then say I want to click on continue to net banking and then continue with my use case. So now in this application, there are two windows open. One is your base window from where we actually logged in. And after I clicked on the login, there is a new window opened up, right? So this is where your switch to command will help us to switching to this particular window to do any of the operations on this web elements present on this window okay now let's see how do we actually do this so in order to do this first you need to get the handle of the window by using a command called driver dot get window handle all right so now when you use driver dot get window handle what you get is a unique alphanumeric value which is an identifier for that window and once you get this, you use a command called driver dot switch to dot window and you pass that handle which you have fetched previously. And this command will actually switch to the current window which is in your focus. Now you will also come across a case where there are multiple windows open. Right now the example what we saw, we just had a single window. But say if you whenever you launch an application, say there are multiple windows which are open. So in such case, you can use something called as get windows handles. Right? Now get windows handles, what it does is it picks up all the active windows at that point of a time. And using a for loop, you can read into every handle and then 
you do your operation specific to your window handles. Also, there is another way wherein you can switch back to your parent window. So if ever you want to switch back to your parent window, you have to use the same command driver.switch to and the handle what you need to provide here is your parent handle. All right. So this is about windows. Then I also said switch to can be used for your frames. So what are frames? Frames are usually used to divide your web application or your web page or the on the same domain into various different windows or sections, right? So for us to operate on elements which are in different frames, we need to first switch to a particular frame and then use the web elements on that. So the same command we'll be using. Now instead of window here, I would say driver dot switch to dot frame. Similarly, even the alert pop-ups can be handled using the same command. So in the case of alert, what you need to do is you have to say driver.switch to dot alert. Question 20, how to upload a file in Selenium WebDriver, right? A very important concept in Selenium WebDriver. We know that Selenium WebDriver is designed for automating web application, right? And file upload is a very common scenario which we get with every web application which we are working with. Now there are two ways to do a file window, a file upload operation. One is using the send keys which is the simplest method and the other way is using robot class. Now there are certain prereqs required for you to work with the send keys option. Now if you are using the send keys option what you basically need to do is you need to type in the complete path of the file along with the file name right in the file select input field now this element where you are going to enter your file name should have certain attributes one of the attributes it should have the tag as input right and also it should have an attribute called type which should have a value of file only then it is possible for you to enter a file name and upload the file okay that is by using the send keys method. Then the other way is using robot. Now when, when is that we need to use robot? Where whenever you have an application and in your application usually for your file upload you have a button which says upload a file and when you click on that it opens a new window and this window is your Windows Explorer window or a finder window depending on what operating system you're working. And these are the native windows. And we know that Selenium WebDriver directly cannot handle the native applications. So in such case, the robot class helps us in managing these native windows. So what happens in the robot classes? It helps you manage your file upload dialog box by simulating all the actions required for selecting a particular file from your dialog box and then you go and upload them all right so this is the example of using the send keys question 25 how to set browser window size in web driver so you can either maximize the window or set it to a certain value now to do this you use a simple functions provided by driver.manage one of the functions using driver.manage is driver.manage.window.maximize. Now this command maximizes the current window and say you want to set a particular window size rather than maximizing it and then for that you have a command called driver.manage.window.setSize. Now this set size takes an argument of the type dimension class. So this is basically when you create a dimension class, you are passing the size of the window which you want to create here, right? So we use the dimension class, define the new dimensions of the window and then pass the object of this dimensions to the set size method. This is one way of doing it. We also saw that using JavaScript executor, we can do any kind of functionality. So if you want to minimize or maximize or set a different size, to your browser windows this can also be done using a javascript okay let's see a quick demo on how do we use this driver.manage.setSize size or the maximize command so let's go to my eclipse here so i have this method written here so i have two methods one method where i am saying i'm going to maximize the window this particular command is where i'm saying driver.manage.window.maximize and i'm launching a facebook application so first let's run this particular method and see how our browser window behaves so i'll just say execute this so now you will see the whole window, your browser window is in maximized mode. So now from here, I'm going to execute the other set of lines here using which I'm going to set a certain size. Now I'll just comment out these two lines and then these are the two commands which I'm going to use. Right? So here what I've done is I've defined an object of the class dimension and I've used 600, 600, which is the size of the window, which I want it to be. And then using the set size, I'm passing this dimension object to the 
set size method. Now let's see how do we look at this browser window now. Did you see that? So it was at a certain size and it just shrunk. It shrunk because I have used a smaller size window. Question 26. When do we use find element and find elements? Now find element, you can use this command to access any single element on your web page. And what does it return? It returns an object of the first matching element of the specified locator. And this is the most common command what we use for working with every web element on the web page. What is find elements? Find elements is used to return a list of web elements. Right? So each element which it identifies is indexed with the number starting from zero. It's just like an array. I'll show you an example of that so that you can understand it better. So let's go to my Eclipse here. Right? So if you look at this locators.java, I have different elements which I have identified using different locating techniques. Right? So for that, I use a simple command called find element. Now say I have a use case, right, wherein I want to fetch all the web elements who have a class name starting with the text input. Let's see what that is. So if I go to my Facebook application, if I try to inspect this say first name, right, so I'll say inspect element. Now here if you see this particular web element has a class name starting with text called as input text. Likewise, there are many elements here like even the surname if you look at it, it has a class name starting with input text. Okay, so if I have a use case like that where I want all the web elements on the Facebook page who have the class name starting with the text input. If I have to do that, that is when I say I'm going to use the driver.find elements. So I say driver.find elements, I give an X path which is going to pick up all those elements which has the class name starting with input. This is my XPath expression. Once I get all the elements, what am I doing? I'm going to store it in a list array. Once I have all these elements created, it's in an array, I'm just going to traverse through the array using an enhanced for loop. So in this program, in this test case, I'm just picking each and every element and printing the attribute ID of each element. So if I execute this now, we should see all the elements on the Facebook page which has the class name starting with input and we should see all the IDs of that. So this is what we are getting. So you are around getting 9 to 10 elements it has picked up and all of them have the class name starting with input and these are their different IDs. Question 27. What is pause on exception in Selenium ID? So pause on exception is a new feature of Selenium ID. It is one of the brilliant debugger function which this new Selenium ID provides us. What it does is it enables us or when this particular option is enabled, the execution of your test pauses if at all there is any exception which occurs in your test scripts. And because of this, what you can do is you can go and handle that error by say changing your command in the script and then continue your test execution. So this helps in debugging your code pretty well. So whenever there is an exception, say for example, a web element which you're trying to identify has a wrong identifier or it changes on your web page. Then you can correct that command which caused the exception and then resume the test execution from that point onwards. So let's look at a simple use case and see how exactly this works. So for example, let's go to my browser here. Okay, so I have a simple use case here where I want to log in into Facebook using my email ID and password. And what I have done is I have created a script or recorded a script using my Selenium ID. So these are all the steps which it has wherein it logs into the Facebook account. Then it clicks on the email field, enters the email. This is my value which I'm passing. Clicks on the password field, enters the password and then clicks on the login button. Now this is a clean test script and all my web elements are correct here. So whenever I'm running this test script, this test script is going to pass. Now say as an example, say this particular element, which is my password element, say this ID changes. So now deliberately what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give a wrong ID here. So if I give a wrong ID and if I execute a test script now, it is going to throw an exception at this point. So let's do that. So it's going to throw an exception, but now since I want to use that pause an exception feature, what I do is it's available here. It says pause an exception. By default, it is switched off. So when you select this, that means this has been switched on. And now if I execute the script, this is going to come into a debug mode at this point where my exception is going to be thrown. So let's see that. So now I have this, I have changed this ID to a wrong ID. So I'll just say go and run this current test. So let's see how it operates. So let me just bring this side by side so you can see here. 
it has entered the email and if you look here in the console it is saying trying to find the id for which i have given pa and 4s which is a wrong id so it will look for some time whether it can find an element with this particular id so let's wait for it to throw the exception there we go so now it tried enough and actually that step has failed and there is an exception saying that that particular web element is not found however my test case or the test script did not exit it has come and paused and it has entered into a debug mode here paused in debug now as a tester or an automation script writer what i can do here is i can simply go and correct this now i know this is my correct id once i correct this i can execute the rest of the script right from this point so now i have this option here if you go here it says resume test execution so i'm just going to click on that so it is going to go ahead and enter everything here if you see here i entered email password and in this test script what i'm doing is i'm entering my first name and my surname instead of clicking on the login button so it went ahead and if you look here it says fb test completed successfully this is how the pause and exception feature helps us question 28 how to log in into any website if it is showing an authentication pop-up for username and password which will be something like this so this is a typical authentication pop-up which you normally see when you are dealing with some web application right and to handle them we use something called as an alert class and alert class comes with a method called authenticate using basically by using this method what we are trying to do is it helps us skip the basic http authentication box so how do we handle it it is handled exactly the way we handle any kind of alert box in selenium now in this example first what we need to do is we need to create a weight object using an explicit weight now this weight is for what it is for the alert to pop up so we basically wait until that authentication alert pops up and set the conditions in this explicit weight for as alert is present so that means you're going to wait until your authentication pop-up is seen on your screen and then once you have that authentication pop-up which is on your screen that is when you need to go and handle it now to handle it for your alert class you're going to call a method as i said using authenticate using and to this you pass a parameter now this parameter has to be your username and password However, the way the parameters are passed here is using a class object called user and password. Now this user and password class, it is a part of Selenium security package. All right. And this is implemented from an interface called credentials. So you create this object of class user and password using the authentication information which you have and then pass this as parameter to your method called authenticate using. And this way you can handle your authentication pop-up. Question 29. What is the difference between single and double slash in XPath? A very important question and it's a very important thing for each of you to understand. Single slash is used to create an XPath with absolute path. That is the XPath would be created right from the starting node and the starting node is slash HTML. And the double slash is created or it's a XPath with relative path. Now relative path, this XPath would be created uh, using any starting location or anywhere within the document. For example, I could start with a div tag, wherein if I mention double slash and div, so this is going to be treated as a relative path and whatever conditions I'm going to give, it is going to try and match those attributes with this tag, right? This is called as a relative path. So why don't we just go and take a look at how do we identify an element using a relative as well as an absolute path. So if I go back to the same application of the Facebook, this is my Facebook application. Now I have this crow path installed, which helps me in identifying X paths of an element. Now say I want to try and see what is the X path of my element first name. So in the inspector tool, I can see that it has a tag input and it has a long class name and it has multiple attributes, which I can use to identify this element. So if I go to my crow path and again, try to match this element, so if I just hover my mouse here, now here you can see this crow path gives me both the path. One is the relative X path and one is the absolute X path. Now look at the big difference between these two. Now relative path was as simple as using a slash slash input, which is the tag and an attribute called ID. We are able to identify this particular element. Same thing if you want to use an absolute path and you, if you see here, it will start right from the slash HTML, which is your starting node of your HTML page. And then it travels down looking into each of the parent and child under this until it found this element input. 
right so this is absolute path so you can use either of these paths to identify your elements question 30 how do you find broken links in selenium web driver now http is designed for what to enable communications between your clients and servers and if you know there are few commands like get put post now get is used to request data from a specified resource put command is used to send data over your server and post is used to send data to the server right now while using these links and uh, trying to figure out if the link is valid or not what you can do is you can use something called as head requests now what are head requests head requests are nothing but they are something like a get request but they do not have a response body and usually this is used for checking that what a get request can return before actually making a get request like say before downloading a large file you would send a head request before sending the complete get just to know whether the link which is provided for downloading a large file is a genuine link or not and then looking at the response code is what you decide that so how do we do this programmatically now selenium provides something called as http url connection class which has some methods to send http request and to capture the http response codes like the ones which you see it on the screen so if we have to see how do we do that now first thing the logic behind how do we get this broken links is you get all the urls on your website first after getting all the urls now how do you get the urls by using the tag a like it is done here so once you get the complete list of all urls you also check for a non val a non null or a blank ones that is one kind of a check which you can put after that you create an http connection object with each of the url and you open the connection of the url and you send the request now this request whatever you are going to send you are going to send the header request to just to get the head and not the complete get request now only thing what you are interested in getting a response code so once you get the response code what you have to do is you have to check the response code against all your response code now typically when you are checking for your response code any response code above 400 is treated as a client error rest all the links below 400 are all the valid links so here if you see 404 you have a response called as link not found 400 is a bad request 401 is unauthorized so you can do a simple check there where it says if your response code is above 500 then that particular link has an error and that is probably going to be your invalid link so let's see that in action as how exactly the code is going to look and how do we achieve that now i have a test case written here called broken links.java now here what i'm doing is i'm logging into facebook.com and then i'm fetching all the elements with the tag a now when i say i'm fetching all the elements with the tag a that means i'm going to get all the href element from the page and once I get that using a for loop I'm going to inspect each and every URL what I'm going to fetch as I said my first check would be to see if it is a null or is it an empty if I find an empty or a null value in the URL I'm just going to ignore that and continue the loop and this is where I actually do the connection with my URL so I create an HTTP URL connection with the URL which I have picked it up from my website then I do this I send a request here the head request to get a response code so once I get this response code is what I put a if else statement and check if my response code is greater than or equal to 400 so if I find that if my response code is more than 400 that means this particular URL link is broken and that is how I identify so once you identify a particular URL which is broken you can make use of that information uh, share it with your developers and get it fixed so let's go ahead and execute this so in this test case basically what i'm going to do is i'm just printing out all the urls and i'm printing the ones which are valid and ones which are broken uh, since it's a, a facebook.com website i do not have any broken url but this is just a logic of how do we find a broken url so if you look here there are a lot of websites which is getting listed which says is a valid link so that means it is getting a response code which is more than 500 so this is what we saw in the demo as how do I iterate after I select all the links on the page and then how do I determine whether it's a valid link or it's a broken link. All right. So that brings us to the end of this interview questions. I hope this should help you and help you to get through any of the interviews which you're going to attend. And also this acts as a pretty good information set for you. So thank you very much for viewing this video. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.